And thank you for joining us. Welcome to this presentation, which is part of an ongoing Goose webinar series exploring global sustained ocean observing. My name is Albert Fisher. I'm the director of the Global Ocean Observing System Program Office, which is based here in Paris at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. And so for the next hour, we'll start with an approximately 30 minute presentation from Bob Weller of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, Bob is also the co-chair of the Ocean Sites Network of Deepwater Ocean Reference Stations. This is one of the most multidisciplinary sustained observing tools that we have. Uh, Bob also happens to have been my graduate advisor, so for me it's a great pleasure to have Bob with us today. Uh, after the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session by chat. You'll see already on your screen that the chat window is open. Uh, so I will moderate and, and select and ask the questions verbally, and I'll try to select questions that are representative, and we'll attempt to answer as many questions as time permits. Um, the chat window is open. You can start asking your questions, clarifying questions already during the talk. Uh, the session is being recorded, and a link will be posted on the Goose webpage. Uh, but for now, I'd like to hand it over to Bob for his presentation. Over to you. Thank you, Albert. Albert, great to see you. Um, we'll get going here. So I co-chair this group, as uh, Albert said, with Uva Send from Scripps. And you know, what what did we think that uh, Ocean Sites is, and what's it supposed to be? It exists as an action group like the Argo Float um, system under the data buoy cooperation panel of JCOM. Uh, in our mind, what we're trying to do is, I mean, success would be looking back 30 years from now and saying those time series uh, that were collected in the ocean by ocean sites really captured uh, across the disciplines the change in variability. And, and in our minds, we think of the uh, atmospheric CO2 uh, curve, the time series that Keeling worked so hard to obtain on the top of Mauna Loa uh, that really clued us into uh, the changing atmospheric composition. So we're trying to do that in the ocean. We're trying to band together in an advocacy and support group and uh, help uh, people sustain long-term uh, high quality time series sites in the ocean, but at the same time we want to make the data available and make sure that we're responsive as a component in the global ocean observing system. Uh, so how are we doing at a very high level? Uh, we're doing well. Uh, this is a map of the uh, existing and planned time series sites. So it is indeed a, a global array. Uh, as Albert said, we strive to represent all disciplines of oceanography and, and surface meteorology and air-sea interaction. Uh, we're committed to free and open sharing of the data, have an excellent data uh, management team that uh, owes a lot to people like Bill Burnett and Sylvie Poquin, who helped uh, get it going. So uh, we're doing well. So this is just a restatement of the mission, uh, collect and deliver and promote the use of high quality open ocean time series sites. Uh, and we're committed to trying to grow the multidisciplinarity of these ocean sites. Uh, now we realize that uh, you can't carpet the ocean. There was an old uh, cartoon in the pre-satellite days of uh, mooring every degree. Uh, we, we know we can't do that. But on the other hand, we want to have enough moorings out there to capture uh, what we would call critical or representative locations in all the ocean basins. So, for example, from a surface meteorological point of view, uh, you might want some in the trade winds, you might want some in the center gyre locations, you might want some at high latitudes and, and certainly in the equatorial belt to capture the MJO and, and ENSO, ENSO uh, variability. So that, that's the rationale and the plan. Uh, how do we manage it? Uh, Uva and I co-chair it. We have a steering committee, an executive committee of about seven people internationally, eight, and we have telcons uh, once a month. We get staff support from Champika Golage at uh, JCOM Ops, and Uva, uh, Send, and I and Champika have another telcon in preparation for the monthly telcons, uh, and also now joined by Derek Snowden to coordinate and take on topics. Uh, Typically an annual meeting or every two years. Our next meeting is in April 
2016, hosted by Richard Lampert and the people at NOC uh, in Southampton. Uh, one of our great successes and one thing we're proud of is uh, to facilitate the open and sharing of the data. Our data team stepped out many years ago uh, to take on to the task of how do you get diverse people to share data in a compatible way. And we developed a net CDF format, uh, the appropriate metadata. There was a lot of work by uh, Sylvie and uh, Bill Burnett and people like Dan Galbraith uh, and people from uh, the UK at the BOTC. There was a lot of work to develop the ontologies and the metadata. And we actually have a data format tester. So if you become an ocean site, you have to put your data through the data tester, make sure it's properly formatted. And then uh, we have two global data assembly centers, uh, National Data Buoy Center uh, in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and the Coriolis Center at Ypres in France. Uh, they have volunteered to collect data as GDACs and to uh, then share it and get it out to, uh, to the community. Uh, if it's an ocean site with telemetry, we like to get the data without delay. If it's a subsurface mooring with no link, we'd like to get it once it's quality controlled uh, and submitted. Uh, so I, I said a bunch of these things about the data management team. Uh, they've actually, to facilitate new people coming on board, we have data format reference guides, we have data providers guide, uh, and the two uh, GDACs are just amazingly supportive and participate with the data team. Uh, status. I mean, many of the sites are occupied. Uh, we've made an effort, like I said before, to be multidisciplinary. Uh, we've made an effort to be responsive to growing needs. So we'll talk about it in a few slides forward. Uh, for example, when we started to hear about the deep ocean observing uh, team, Eric Lindstrom and all, and the need for deep temperature data, we took on a new component in ocean sites to get uh, deep ocean salinity and temperature time series. Uh, so we try to be responsive and work with the operations coordination group and uh, with DBCP. So another map of the status. This is, this is a recent map provided by Champica. Uh, active sites in green, uh, planned sites, new expansion sites in, in uh, the red triangles, and some discontinued sites. Uh, now, ocean sites as itself does not have funds per se and does not manage sites. We're really a banding together of uh, principal investigators and uh, operators uh, from the different countries around the world to get the strength of the commonality and partip to participate in GOOSE. Uh, so as I said before, some subsurface moorings are what we call delayed mode. Uh, they get recovered once a year or every few years, and then the data is quality controlled and submitted. Uh, things with a surface expression, uh, we accept the telemetry in real time. Uh, just an idea of all the countries participating, a very diverse group of countries. Uh, we have a process by which you become an ocean site and you qualify and you submit an application and the supporting metadata and information, uh, and then it's considered. Uh, we're really seeking sites that have a commitment to the free and open of sharing of data and also to being sustained uh, for, for a number of years. We're really not in the business of hosting uh, process study or short-lived experimental data sets. Uh, we're trying to be multidisciplinary, so a few slides in the different disciplines, some geophysics, some biogeochemistry, I mean notably FIX03, and Richard Lampett and other people pushing on the biogeochemistry, uh, some air sea flux sites, a number of the sites, quite a few sites, as you can see, make PCO2 measurements. Uh, a lot of physical oceanography still, you know, perhaps the sensors the most resilient to biofouling and other issues, and the most common sensors are the temperature, salinity, uh, and current sensors, and then the surface buoys or the surface meteorology. Uh, an idea of where what GDACs are associated with what data sets. Uh, we like to pair people with GDACs. The GDACs will provide a lot of support in the formatting and quality control. Uh, on the other hand, if people feel 
capable of doing that quality control and formatting, uh, then they just end up running their own sort of data assembly center and submitting the data to the GDAX. And, and Ephraimer and NDVC try to mirror the total holdings so they're duplicated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we try to be responsive to needs. And so when we heard about the discussion of uh, the drift in climate models, the lack of uh, deep temperature salinity data, both for model initialization and to uh, constrain the drift and learn more about change in variability in the deep ocean, ocean sites took on a project. I mean, the point of view was that we had many sites around the world already. Uh, people and ships were going out there every year or several years. It was not a large effort to add uh, deep microcats, uh, SB37s, to those existing sites. Uh, so we went to POGO, the Partnership for Ocean Global Observation, and to individual directors of institutions and PIs. And we said, uh, we want to raise the funds. We created a challenge. We want to raise the funds to have POGO help us match uh, SBE37s that the PIs were contributing. Uh, we also got into a dialogue with Seabird to provide, and they agreed to provide uh, at no cost ongoing recalibration and servicing of these deep uh, 37s. And so we were very successful in, in uh, growing uh, quite a few of these microcats. As you can see, we started in 2011 at our uh, scientific com committee meeting. We were uh, had awesome support from POGO, from the National Oceanography Center in the UK, in particular, made a significant contribution. Uh, so we now have about 50 microcats in a pool available to be requested, and we're working on the uh, processes and metrics by which we uh, grant sites some of these pooled microcats. Uh, these are the sites uh, installed and planned for the deep ocean observations. Uh, if you have any input, uh, we would love to have input about where deep temperature and salinity measurements should be made. Uh, we recently communicated from ocean sites uh, to uh, International Clivar asking the basin panels for input, uh, to the OOPC uh, asking them for input, seeking guidance, and we would readily accept from you all a guidance on where deep ocean temperature and salinity time series uh, should be uh, collected to help with the constraining climate models and other issues and, and monitoring change in the deep ocean. We are trying to work with uh, Eric Lindstrom et al.'s uh, team and with other folks to understand the challenges. And I think there are some of the calibration uh, control of deep ocean temperature and salinity. Uh, we have a bit of a concern that uh, instruments, these aren't pumped instruments, uh, these are sitting uh, at depth, and we're a little bit concerned about uh, calibration shifts in those instruments. Uh, anecdotally, we've heard that algal or bacterial films grow on the conductivity sensors and then when you release the mooring they get flushed off so a post calibration might not might not tell you uh, how they go we are supplying two at each site and encouraging people to do uh, deep ctd casts in the vicinity of the mooring uh, immediately after deployment and before recovery but any input on how to proceed with the technology on that project or locations would be greatly, greatly welcomed. Sort of looking toward the future, uh, one of our notions again is that we have many sites where people are going out routinely. Uh, there's ship time and, and the financial resources committed to these sites. Uh, what would it take, we asked, uh, to come up with a common set of biogeochemical sensors across a subset. Uh, so that's been a, another project that we've been discussing in the group. Uh, one of the notions is that maybe for some tens or 100K, each site could be, each of these highlighted sites with the dark circles could be developed into having a common multidisciplinary uh, payload. And so again, that's an idea that we'd like some input on, whether that's a good thing to try to grow. Uh, a global array of multidisciplinary sensors and time series and, and suggestions on how to get there would also be uh, welcomed. Uh, again, some of the ideas and some of the maps we've been making, 
Uh, we're, we're working with the ocean acidity community, with the biogeochemical communities, people like Ancha Boitjes on the steering committee and Richard Lampert are a great help in this and, and Tom Troll. And we think there's merit in uh, a global array. Sometimes in dealing with modelers or community, we come up against the response that, well, yes, you have one or two sites that have those instruments in ocean sites, but that's almost anecdotal evidence. Uh, you know, we want to see that data from a order 10 or a global array to really understand if there's common trends and variability. Uh, what are we doing now in, in the team? We're working very hard on our website and our documentation. Uh, the green things are what we've uh, finished and they're out on our website. Uh, the orange uh, yellow things are things we're working on right now. Uh, a current topic and a topic we want to take on for the uh, Southampton meeting in, in April is the notion of performance metrics and the overall ocean sites strategy. In other words, if somebody said, uh, you know, what's your vision and, and what's your percent complete or uh, how do you judge whether you're, you're having success, uh, we want as a community in ocean sites to develop these performance metrics. And again, uh, it's something we would welcome uh, input on. Uh, we try to, in some of these documents, we try to, for example, capture the benefits to people in different countries. Uh, for joining ocean sites and and uh, these sorts of documentation are out there. Uh, we try to do a lot of uh, mentoring and uh, capacity building, offering help to people that come in. Uh, for example, if people aren't familiar with a given type of sensor or instrument, we try to match them up with other people in the group that have that familiarity. And, and if we do push multidisciplinary sensors across uh, many different sites, uh, we, we recognize that we have to have some expertise or some mentors to help guarantee the quality uh, of sensors and instruments that people aren't familiar with. Uh, challenges and opportunities as we look to the future. Uh, it's, you know, that to some extent it's a challenging time for the, for the funding of sustained ocean observing and, and given the fact that moorings require uh, ded dedicated ship time and of a special type of ship time. They have to be there at a specific site at a specific turnaround interval. Uh, so that's certainly a challenge for us is, is uh, going forward, building the constituency and the advocacy so that in the different nations and the different programs uh, in the different countries, there's recognition of the value and that the funding for these sites uh, are sustained. You can see, for example, in the tropical Pacific, there's an ongoing uh, discussion under the TPOS effort of uh, how do you refine and evolve uh, that time series array uh, in recognition of some of the challenges. Again, it's an area from anybody in this group, Albert, that we would, we would gratefully accept uh, any guidance uh, and advice. Uh, starting new sites, uh, you know, we welcome input. Uh, and we're seeking input uh, from the different international groups uh, that have views. Uh, it would be hard for us without explicit funding to uh, initiate a site. It's not something we can do. We would need to work with the different PIs and the different national and programmatic groups uh, to support them. And so we want to build interaction with things like the Clivar Basin Panels uh, and or the observations coordination group as we go forward. Uh, what, another challenge, uh, frankly, is uh, continuing to get the people who promised to have open and free sharing of data to commit to that. Uh, we've adopted and agreed to adopt the notion that uh, the dots on the map will disappear or turn black if the data isn't submitted, sort of a public acknowledgement that people uh, need to get on with submitting the data. Uh, again, guidance from other of the components of the Goose uh, as to how to keep everybody in your team submitting data, we'd gladly welcome that sort of guidance. Another challenge for us is, is getting the contributions uh, from the different countries to support uh, Champica's uh, participation in the JCOMOPS uh, project office. 
uh, besides her time, we try to raise sufficient funds that she also has access to IT support uh, at JCOM Ops, which helps maintain uh, our website and uh, keep our keep our presence current. Uh, we've been getting good contributions uh, from the U.S., NOAA, Australia, France, and China, and some of the POGO institutions. Uh, if you have ideas or you want to contribute, again, we'd be uh, very welcome any inputs. I'm going to end up with a couple of exemplary time series from work that I do, and apology for touting my own work, but I wanted to get across to you all the type of thing we're doing. And so this is a time series uh, mooring uh, site uh, north of Oahu at the station Aloha uh, site. It used to be a hot mooring, an NSF-funded mooring there. Uh, that uh, was ended, but uh, NOAA partnered with NSF in the U.S., and now there's a, a time series mooring that Al Plutum and I, under NOAA support, do the mooring, and uh, Roger Lucas, my, Matt Church, and Dave Carl and others get NSF support for the ocean instrumentation. So on the left, you see the, the atmospheric and oceanic uh, CO2 and acidity time series, and that's certainly something that's being continued. Uh, and there are monthly cruises there, but the important thing about the time series is it captures the high-frequency episodic variability uh, that the time series from the ships do not capture. And it, it continues to be a site of interest to the ocean CO2 community with the ocean getting acidic. Uh, and you can see in the right some of the time series. The mooring, our mooring was established there in July of 2004 and has been continuing. Uh, so you can see the, the green, the blue, and the black uh, time series of of CO2 and SST there. What's also interesting there and in the panel to the bottom right is that we're seeing a combination of long-term trends or changes in the surface forcing and in the upper ocean properties. So from the surface meteorology we're seeing less clouds, increasingly greater uh, visible radiation or insulation uh, and coupled with that uh, there's been a change in the regional hydrological cycle so that it's switching more to greater evaporation and less precipitation. That's been reflected in, in the upper ocean uh, in the plots in the bottom there. What we're seeing is we're seeing a greater uh, a warming and a salinification of the upper ocean at the Hawaii site. And this is something that may have implications for the stability or the overturning uh, the ability to overturn of the upper ocean. If you're making the uh, mixed layer and the upper thermocline more dense, you're basically eroding the N square, the stability profile, and that may have also uh, implications on the Hawaii region uh, ecosystem. And Roger Lucas and colleagues have done a lot of comparisons to look at uh, model products and establish sort of the area of influence in which the buoy covers. And some of these trends in the hydrological cycle are also seen in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, skip to one last example, uh, a site off northern Chile. We've been off northern Chile under the marine stratus uh, since October 2000 with NOAA support. It started as a part of a CLIVAR regional study. Uh, it became a sustained site funded by NOAA Climate Observation Division. It's been a site, and many of our ocean sites are, where a process study called VOCALS, which was an atmospheric and oceanographic process study to study marine stratus and, and the ocean dynamics there, aggregated there. It's a particularly interesting region because of the marine stratus and because of the eastern boundary biases in SST that are typical. And I just wanted to show you an example of some of the results. Uh, at, at the Stratus Watson, uh, the three sites that we maintain, NTAS and the Atlantic, uh, our data goes out uh, via satellite telemetry, but we don't put it on GTS. So the surface meteorological data is not in model initializations. It's withheld. Uh, we actually share that data with NCEP and with ECMWF, but in a delayed mode where they give us uh, the nearby grid points of the operational model and we give them access to the buoy data. But we want these time series as truly withheld and independent references. So here's an example where I've taken out uh, 
the annual cycle, and I've got the annual means computed, and I'm looking at two different sets of graphs. In the lower right, uh, you see the wind stress. And what's been surprising at the site off uh, northern Chile is that for 15 years now, the southeast trade winds have steadily increased. And so the trade winds have increased about 15%, and so the stress has gone up about 30%. Uh, but I find it very interesting that although the ERA, the European reanalysis, and NCEP2 reanalysis capture some of the trend in uh, the Pacific trade winds, look at how different the amplitudes are and, and how much of an overestimate or uh, how too high biased the uh, ERA stress is. It's really remarkably too high. Uh, and so that's sort of the dialogue we get into. Uh, with ECMWF about uh, why the model has biases and uh, we've been trying to serve these time series as efficiently as possible. Groups like GSOP, Keith Haynes and Lee Sun Yu had a flux workshop at uh, Woods Hole and in response to that we made it even easier on our own website for people to get these reference sites. Another thing very interesting on the left is uh, along with the steady increase in the Pacific trades uh, we're seeing a, a uh, declining of the annual mean net sea air sea heat flux. So when we first there, went there, the ocean was being warmed annually by about 50 watts per square meter. The buoy data, the blue, shows that that's steadily uh, decreasing with time, getting to be a smaller gain. What's again very interesting is that the European uh, model reanalysis product actually suggests that, you know, Somewhere this year or last year or, or a year, couple of years ago, that region changed from one of net heat gain to uh, net air sea heat loss. Now, again, interesting is the NSEP model doesn't really have a statistically significant decrease. There's a slight downward trend, but the air sea heat flux uh, in the NSEP model is quite different from that of the actual measurements on the buoy. And we go to great lengths on the buoy. What we do is we have Chris Farrell from uh, Ezreal Boulder come out on the ship uh, and he's a third party independent verification of the quality of the surface meteorology and, and we address uh, drift over the years deployment by deploying the new buoy uh, and overlapping it with the old buoy. So these, these data are quite accurate and so these are meaningful trends and it goes to the point of what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide high quality in C2 time series so that people can understand the change in variability uh, in the ocean. Uh, so forward look, uh, wrapping up here, uh, we're contributing to the deep ocean observing system. We're pushing to be multidisciplinary and join other groups in the planning of that. Uh, we're pushing to achieve a high percentage of data submission. We will take on the topic at our next meeting and have discussions of what products and indices uh, can we Create it, and how do we share them, and how do we work with the modeling and other communities uh, to get the most value out of the Ocean Sites time series? We are having a discussion with Clavera Basin Panels, OPC, and others about what potential gaps people might see in the global coverage and how they might be closed. We're trying to make the Ocean Sites platforms widely available to other PIs to add to or as process study aggregation sites. And, and the more we feel, the more users we get, the more routine users pulling in our data, the better shape we'll be in. So last slide, uh, there is a website. Uh, please visit us uh, and please give us input. Uh, we're in service of the community and service of Goose, and we welcome your input. I see a question from Libby. Thank you very much, Paul. Yes. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, going to either Ephraimera or Coriolis, you get to the data. And there's a link off that oceansites.org where you, where you will be directed to the data holdings. So thanks very much, Bob, and thanks for getting uh, jump started on it. So thanks very much, Bob, and thanks for getting uh, jump started on answering uh, questions. Uh, and I encourage questions. everyone else to, to uh, answer questions, to ask questions in the chat window. Um, and while we're waiting for those questions, I'll ask a few of my own. 
So very early in your talking made a comparison to the Keeling curve. So very early in your talking made a comparison to the Keeling curve. Um, and one of the big differences between the atmosphere and the ocean. And one of the big differences between the atmosphere and the ocean is the atmosphere has really fast mixing scales and, and large structures. And the ocean has really uh, is much smaller in terms of the time and the space so scale of its variability. So in ocean sites, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that either in terms of trying to capture that spatial variability around the sites, or with complementary observations, or by choosing your sites very carefully? Well, you know, I mean, one of the commitments in ocean sites, Albert, is to uh, if you want to be an ocean site, one of the things we stress is uh, your time series sites has to address the fast time scales. So, for example, as, as you well know, uh, the diurnal, you know, in terms of air-sea interaction, uh, diurnal warming is a big deal. And in terms of ocean mixing, uh, near-inertial oscillations set off by episodic wind events are a big deal. So one of the things we strive for is uh, when people instrument moorings is we want fast temporal resolution. So a lot of the surface meteorology is at once per minute, and a lot of the ocean data is every five or ten minutes. Uh, and we and in the ocean, we would like to have people have uh, high high vertical resolution. Uh, so we we do know we have to resolve uh, fast mixing events like near inertial uh, events in the ocean. So Lisa has a question about um, the list of location, so about, um, list of location variables, and particularly how many of those sites have deep measurements below 500 meters? Well, we had a slide uh, that showed them, and we can look back at that. But we're, we're building on the website. There should be a place to go and uh, bring up the existing deep sites. So it, it's of order uh, 15 or 20 deep sites that are all already collecting the data. One of the things, you know, that we wondered about uh, is, you know, if we just put the deep ocean time series into the GDAX, I mean, for example, Stratus off northern Chile has two SBE 37s or 16s right above the uh, glass balls by the acoustic releases at 5,000 meters. Uh, we're a little worried that people won't navigate to that deep data. So, I mean, under the deuce, Albert, uh, and with the deep Argo, is there a place to aggregate or collect the deep ocean data that we should be submitting to? And this, you know, at this point, there isn't a clear depository for deep data. Um, um, but I guess uh, you mentioned that on the ocean sites in the future website, we're going to have a way of filtering for that kind of uh, data that would be a way, to highlight, the way to highlight the existence of that deep data. Um, that's a little bit related to, um, that's a little bit related to um, Tasta's question, which is, where, um, which is whether you use fit based time series in the network design. Uh, because there are some places like Aloha where there are ship based measurements that are repeated monthly or at a higher frequency. Yeah, you know. And and, uh, is that part of the network design? Uh, you think about that with ocean sites. We've, we've had a lot of discussion of ship-based data, uh, and basically we've come down to uh, when ship-based data is uh, related to a mooring time series, we want to bring it in and provide access to it, and that's the question at uh, Aloha. Uh, but ship-based reoccupations of a given site uh, fail our metric often of the high time resolution. So going out once a month with a ship, for example, it, with no time, with no mooring, it, is not in our mind an ocean site's site. Uh, I hope that, that makes it clear. Are there any places where an ocean, 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 ocean site's moored time series with high time resolution is co-located with one of these ship space time series? Well, that would be the the Hawaii one would be the best example where uh, Dave Carl and colleagues go out once a month and do the biogeochemistry uh, right uh, next to the mooring, basically, at the Aloha site. Uh, I think that's the best example I can think of. 
um, John has a John Gold um, has a question. John has a, John Gold uh, has a question about uh, again the complementarity between different types of observers. Uh, John, John, um, in, in ocean sites, so ocean sites uh, make use of autonomous vehicles. In ocean sites, we ourselves don't do that, but the individual PIs, uh, in if you talk to somebody uh, like Roger Lucas, for example. Uh, where there are gliders and other work done at Aloha, then that there is the attempt. And, and uh, I know in the work that Al Pluteman and I do, uh, we did, we've tried two different things. We, for several years, we instrumented uh, commercial container ships that went by the Hawaii and the uh, NTAS Atlantic sites. And we looked at the statistics and covariability uh, of the surface meteorology versus the time series buoy to get try to get an establishment of the regional context. Uh, that was actually very frustrating because the ships varied their course to avoid storms and because the synoptic weather time scale and the time it takes a fast container ship to move by were sort of similar. So that failed. I think more promising, John, is the thing that we've done, uh, say, off Chile where people have gotten collected the uh, surface drifters and the Argo floats uh, to establish a regional context. For example, Stratus now carries every other year dissolved oxygen sensors uh, and colleagues at Germany, uh, Lothar Strama uh, and René Seychelles have collected uh, shipboard, uh, Argo float, uh, regional data to look at the regional context for the low oxygen minimum layer. Uh, also in that region, uh, uh, Roland Dezerka has gone out and collected uh, shipboard data to set the regional context for the surface meteorology and fluxes. So it, it does happen, but it typically happens, John, with, within the program that sponsors the site. Barbara Moore, I have, um, quite, an I have um, quite an echo. Uh, so can we try um, when so you're can not we try speaking, um, you when you're yourself? not speaking that you mute yourself? Okay, so I'll just ask. Uh, okay, question. so I'll one just the, ask uh, the next question. One of the one of the defining sites features of ocean sites, sites, sites is that it's deep water is sites. Is there a fundamental difference between coastal time series observations and deep water time series observations? Or is that more of a practical choice to make the That that's more of a practical that that's more of a practical perspective, Albert. Uh, there's so many coastal moorings, uh, for example, in the U.S. Hayus uh, are in different countries. Uh, it, it was felt that the blue water sites were the ones that needed some uh, aggregation advocacy and organization. Uh, having said that, though, I think that's one of the functions of our participation in under DBCP is it gives the opportunity for some technology cross-pollination between uh, the tropical arrays, the blue water arrays, and the coastal arrays. All right, so let's try uh, a question from Katie Hill. Um, about how, how new sites are Do you think that, that ocean sites is getting the guidance and feedback it needs from we talked to the panels and mentioned both PC, but also they will provide the chemistry panel and the uh, biology panel and via the JCOM observations coordination group. Are there ways to improve that feedback loop about requirements? Uh, well, Katie, as you know, we just sent out an email query to uh, OOPC, and I should have done, gone uh, to the other panels too. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, we would love we would love more feedback. Uh, you know, I think participating in the OCG is one way to get the feedback. But I think we're at a time uh, where guiding the forward evolution of ocean sites, uh, we would really appreciate, you know, comment and feedback uh, from, well, for example, TPOS, uh, from the ocean panels, from the Clive Basin panels, uh, from any group. I mean, you know, where should we have sites? And, and, and that would help us. I think make progress toward metrics and a and a strategic uh, plan. Um, 
So sorry about the echo. Um, so sorry about the echo. We can't do anything about it. We haven't, we haven't been able to figure out how to turn it off. Let me ask uh, Gwen Griffith's question. So let me ask uh, Gwen Griffith's question. Uh, do you have a specific example where the high temporary resolution data has caused you to reevaluate accepted wisdom based on measurements that did not satisfy Nyquist's sampling theorem? Yeah, Gwen, good question. I mean, I, I would fall back on one of my own sites, the uh, Stratus site. You know, I said that uh, wind stress has steadily increased and increased about 30% over 15 years, and the annual mean net heat flux is putting less heat in. Uh, what's interesting is you would think that uh, those sorts of magnitude of changes in the mechanical forcing, the stress, and in the buoyancy forcing would turn up some evidence in things like SST or mixed layer depth. Uh, or in the annual cycle of you know SSD and mixed layer depth, and and actually they haven't. Uh, you know, if I used uh, monthly mean forcing and forced a model, I'd get the wrong answer. And what's surprising there is the control of temperature off northern Chile and the restratification each year depends upon the fact that even though these mean properties have changed, there's still about 20 days uh, in each year where the trade winds sag and die to close to zero, uh, the marine stratus clouds clear, and strong insulation uh, forces strong diurnal restratification. And you'll get a sequence of days in which SST comes up two to three degrees every afternoon, but it gets rectified, uh, that high frequency stuff, and causes a restratification and rewarming uh, in spite of the fact of the mean property changes. What are the times um, the spatial scales of that? Are there ways to diagnose that from satellite? Or that phenomenon you just yeah, described? Yeah, it's interesting, Albert. Uh, people uh, have looked at uh, satellite wind products. Uh, and basically, it's a large aerial. It's a large area. What you're getting is, if you think of the Andes and the coast of Chile, and then offshore to the southwest is the South Pacific High. Uh, there's a sort of a modulation in the synoptic weather patterns in the eastern South Pacific, where a broad region between the spatial gradient and barometric pressure, the surface pressure seems to just fade, and, and the trade winds collapse over a broad area for a number of days. So one of the analogies one so can make about, one one can make about what you're trying to do with ocean sites is the ship ram. Um, and this is the space on a mooring. How successful has it and widespread is it to have multiple PIs putting different types of sensors on a single mooring? Uh, let's see. I, I think modestly successful, and it, and it's been a, it's been uh, site by site. Uh, on our sites, for example, we partner with National Data Buoy Center to host NDBC wave packages. We partner with NOAA PMEL to have PCO2 packages. Uh, we've grown on uh, the stratus mooring, as I said, dissolved oxygen sensors by partnering with people at Kiel. Uh, in Germany, I actually think we haven't done enough uh, and we don't understand quite the means by which we should go after the community to identify uh, the opportunities. And, and then, you know, there's some, that puts some burdens upon the site operator. I mean, if you want to put an instrument in line, for example, we have to understand that it's not going to create any risk uh, to the mooring, for example, if the load bar breaks uh, and the mooring falls. So it, you know, that's probably a, a topic that we should take on in the next annual meeting of, of uh, revving up the process by which we qualify and accept additional instrumentation for the moorings. Are the challenges you think to that? Uh, you talked Are the about challenges you think to that? Uh, you talked about what you mentioned was all individual problems. Are the challenges uh, then mostly about aligning challenges funding? Challenges then uh, mostly about aligning funding, uh, aligning funding uh, or are they more logistical, like the one you mentioned about, about, the, about the strength of the mine? Oh, you know, I, I would. Uh, 
Well, I think I think each site operator takes on the challenge of the funding. Uh, you know, the incremental cost of putting an additional sensor on the mooring, that's not that great. And I mean, that can be handled by uh, colleague to colleague cooperation. Uh, I mean, you know, there's going to be costs, but I, I, I think, you know, if, if somebody could write, wrote a small proposal to their own agency to add something to a given ocean site, that should work, I think. And we have a very interesting question from uh, Marcelo D'Alessio. We have a very interesting question from uh, Marcelo D'Alessio. So he's a farmer, and he's interested in looking for. So he's a uh, farmer, and he's interested in looking for uh, in this indicators of the, the Gulf Stream, which are some of the final products of what we might have from the entire Do you want to say anything about where that kind of information might be available? Uh, where that kind of information might be available? Oh, bet boy, I bet some of you guys know better. But uh, and I'm thinking of the cable across the Florida cable for transport monitoring of the Gulf Stream. Uh, maybe, can you think of anything else? Well, there are uh, some uh, indices. Uh, well, there the are uh, some uh, indices uh, on the OOPC and, website. Um, maybe Katie Hill can and, type, um, the, uh, maybe Katie Hill URL, can type the, uh, the URL into the well, chat window. Those are different indicators. A lot of them based on. Those are different indicators. A lot of them based on sea surface temperature uh, of, of the state the, of the ocean climate. Of the state of the ocean climate. But overall, actually, the, the question that Marcella but overall, actually, the, the question that Marcella raises is something that's being tried, trying to be addressed at a higher level through something called the Global Framework for Climate Services, which is about serving climate information and climate forecasts to uh, different sectors, including farming, water management, uh, health, etc. That you can look a little bit more about if you go to TFCS, um, and maybe I can ask Katie to type the. Uh, the link to that as well. Let me come back to you, um, some questions about ocean sites. Let me come back to you, um, some you questions have, about ocean sites. Uh, um, you have uh, you talked about the data system that you built up for ocean sites. What's the intercomparability or intercompatibility with other observing platforms? Have you worked on common vocabularies, not just amongst ocean sites, but with Argo and with other GoShip and others, and different common ways of treating uncertainty in those, so that a scientist can use a lot of networks all at once? Well, that's a great question, Albert. Um, and I and I and I, I'm going to struggle with the answer. I mean, what I, what I'll say is that uh, we've participated recently uh, in some EU-funded programs, uh, Cupius, for example, uh, which was. EU funding directed at interoperability of geophysical observatories. Uh, and what we did there is, I mean, our partner was EMSO, the European Multidisciplinary Seafloor Observatories. And what we did is we got Nan Galbraith from the o Ocean Sites data team involved. And uh, we looked at how do we share, uh, you know, the naming and the metadata, uh, and she went over and she looked at uh, to what extent the goose, the geo data portal uh, was a way uh, to submit uh, ocean sites data. And I have, have to admit that uh, I'm not sure that we made that great a progress. Uh, and I think that's a question, you know, for you, you all and for JCOM perhaps, uh, I mean, I know we've built our own data system, uh, has some similarities to the Argo data system, but uh, how do we now converge these different data systems? You're very right. It's definitely a topic for the uh, JCOM. You're very right. It's definitely a topic for the uh, JCOM right. observations coordination group. Let me turn on. Uh, um... Let me turn uh, um, to some questions about um, technological innovation. In terms of sensors, what are you most excited about? What's coming online? Oh boy! Well, you know, I know. Well, personally, I think. Uh, I mean, it, it harks back to the Arabian Sea experiment, Albert, where having non-physical sensors in the Arabian Sea, we learned about some of the mixing events 
uh, when the nutrients were ejected in from the coast. Uh, I mean, I, I think the addition of the deep of the oxygen sensors on the mooring off Chile, for example, uh, is really exciting. Uh, right below the upper thermocline, there's the low oxygen minimum layer. Uh, from a physics point of view, uh, to offset the surface evaporation, you need to bring in a lot of uh, fresh water. Uh, one way to bring that fresh water in would be to do very active vertical mixing with a fresh cold subtropical mode water uh, that lies below the upper thermocline there. But the presence of the low oxygen layer uh, constrains your thinking about how active a vertical mixing you can do because you'd erode the low oxygen minimum layer. So I think our efforts to add some of these non-physical sensors are going to drive further insights uh, into the dynamics and the processes. And I think that's pretty, that's very exciting. Uh, I mean, I, I think that programs internationally, I mean, Richard's work uh, in FIX-03, I think the US NSF OOI fielding a lot of multidisciplinary sensors. I mean, it's great to see a lot of people just putting gear in the water and we're starting to learn about the file following and calibration problems and performance problems. Uh, and that's also part of our notion of the should ocean sites go forward with a common multidisciplinary array. Uh, I mean, I guess we're feeling that uh, things like dissolved oxygen, uh, maybe pH, and maybe some of the other sensors are ready to get broader distribution and that a global array would be an exciting step forward. But we're welcome for input there. Yeah, let me go back again to the, the yeah, let me go back again to the, the Keeling curve, which you mentioned at the very beginning of your time. From the longest um, from time, the time series we have from the ocean, what do you the think are the most important scientific discoveries we've, we've made? Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to put it in the context of uh, the whole observing system. I mean, I think the... I think the convergence, for example, in my mind of uh, changes in the surface wind field on a large scale, uh, including changes like in the westerlies in the southern ocean, playing together with uh, warming at different depths and say the modification of the Antarctic bottom water and the westerlies bringing that Antarctic bottom water uh, to the base of the Western Antarctic ice ice sheets. I mean, I think this this putting together of all the pieces from the time series, the repeat hydrography. I mean, surface meteorology changes, water mass changes. I think that's what's really exciting is that the, we're starting to have you know decades, two decades, and true global coverage, and I think that's really exciting. And I can imagine what you mentioned before. And I can imagine what you mentioned before about adding uh, new variables and we'll other sensors. We'll just expand that capability, in and it's particularly important in the context of, of climate change and trying to meet uh, targets in climate change. You showed some uh, examples. You where showed some uh, examples where you're comparing uh, surface flux with models. Are there other efforts to really look at, um, aspects, to really look at um, other aspects of model performance? Uh, based on these time series? Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I, you know, some of the things uh, that, that, uh, you know, I know NOAA has funded, uh, there's a small program, Sandy Lucas's program, uh, to, to look at uh, biases in the, in the Pacific. You know, I know there's different efforts to use some of these time series to, uh, understand why models have biases, say, in the eastern boundary regions. Um, you know, there's Megan Cronin's Keo mooring. I mean, there's, there's, there's attempts to, in strong uh, western boundary currents, to look at the uh, air sea fluxes. Uh, some of the various highest heat losses occur in the outflow regions of the Curitio and the Gulf Stream. And I think those are very challenging regions for models. So I think there, you know, there has been a product and a program in the past, as you know, SURFA, 
where surface uh, meteorological and air sea flux time series are being used to con to uh, look at the performance of models. And uh, I think we need more meetings like the meeting that Keith Haynes and Lisa and you had and having segments of the modeling community come together with the observing community and identify you know, specific issues. Uh, I mean, they said they had trouble with access, so we worked to facilitate access. I mean, I'd have the flip, I'd have the reverse view. It's challenging for me to get model data. Uh, can that be facilitated? Okay. So a lot of a lot of work to do in that data. And so a lot of a lot of work to do in that data and inter space. Um, so I know from having gone out to see from, with you that uh, setting and removing a, a reliable uh, complex deep water mooring takes a lot of skill, a lot of ship time, a lot of human effort. How do you resist the pressure from funding agencies to innovate and try new ways of observing? Well, that I mean that goes to uh, that goes to developing the right products, indices, and user base. Uh, to demonstrate the unique attributes of the time series as being worth the investment. So back to uh, Gwyn, you know Gwyn Griffith's question, uh, you know, for example, the, in the Hawaii region, uh, what Roger Lucas has seen is, you know, they get eddies that come sometimes all the way from Baja California and drift across the site and and uh, advect water mass variability with them. So he's seen dramatic changes in many standard deviations in deep TS properties uh, due to advective features. You know, you have to resolve those in the time series. Uh, it would be very hit or miss to think that you'd, you would get a picture of that that was accurate on the month by month uh, basis. I mean, other things, I mean, like off, off northern Chile, or in the eastern boundary regions where the models have such uh, biases in SST. I mean, I think it takes a surface mooring with the good air sea fluxes and meteorology, and then the good vertical resolution up through the upper thermocline to the surface to diagnose, uh, you know, why are the model biases there? Is it they have the wrong fluxes, or do they have the wrong ocean physics? And, uh, you know, given the fact of the diurnal the nonlinearity of the ocean mixed layer and the high frequency of the diurnal response and the high frequency of near inertial mixing, uh, I don't see anything short of uh, time series mooring bringing some of the critical evidence. On the other hand, you have to admit that uh, you have to get the advective terms. Uh, the NSF OOI has taken the strategy that its global sites are made up of uh, four moorings in a loose triangle set on the Rosby radius def deformation and supplemented by five patrolling gliders. Uh, you know, I think single mooring sites are have some shortcomings into how one estimates the U dot grad property and other terms. Uh, the new NSF OOI sites are, are better suited to addressing uh, the full three-dynamic, uh, three-dimensional physics but that's quite an investment, uh, four moorings and five gliders turned every year. And do you see any uh, technological innovations that will make that process of deploying and recovering moorings uh, any easier? You know, I don't. <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, you, you need a large global class ship to deal with the weather and carry the payload. Uh, you need skilled people, as you mentioned. I think our innovations are going to come in better power availability on moorings, uh, better payload carrying capacity, as we understand why moorings break and correct it, a better two-way communication to get uh, data back in real time, uh, better, more multidisciplinary sensors and more resistant to biofouling. But there's no getting around. You have to go out there in a ship. Well, and that points also to the importance of a network like Ocean Sites, where you can share that experience and share the knowledge about how best to do that in the in the most reliable and cost efficient way. Right. So our time is up. 
I'm going to wrap up and thank you very much, uh, Bob, for the for the talk. It was a great uh, discussion afterwards as well, and thanks to everybody. Um, I will look forward and say that we have two um, webinars scheduled uh, next month in January 2016 uh, from Nadi Panardi, who's a co-president of a joint commission we have with WMO for Oceanography and Marine Meteorology, and from David Legler, who's a co-chair of that coordination group, observations coordination group under JCOM. So you can see those um, on the Goose website, and you can read about uh, you'll, you can read them in your email. Uh, thanks everybody, and uh, if we don't talk before the end of the year, happy new year and uh, happy holidays to everyone. Thanks, Albert. Thanks, Bob.